Okay, so um, last time uh, I started talking, I talked about the church Turing uh, thesis, and I just want to remind you of what that is, which is a formal definition of what an algorithm is. Is any uh, method or idea or procedure that can be implemented on a Turing machine. Okay, so up to now in all of your courses, you've of course dealt with algorithms and you've learned many of them and you've implemented them in programming languages and so on. And algorithms are you know, stock and trade. But you probably never had a, a, a rigorous definition of one because uh, it's very difficult to do that. And what Turing contributed here, among many, many, many other things, but the beginning of this, is a clean, clear definition of what an algorithm is. And uh, then there's the question of, well, how appropriate or how useful is that definition? And uh, I mentioned last time that this, is, this definition basically has withstood the test of time, that every other uh, suggested definition of what a Turing machine is, uh, sorry, what an algorithm is, uh, has been shown to be equivalent to this, that what you could do on those alternative uh, proposed machines you could do on a Turing machine. And uh, so this is a theory uh, of what Turing machines can and can't do. And uh, you know, the question of how robust that theory is is um, you know, still open to interpretation, but it's, it's been shown to be very, very robust over the last 80 years. Okay, so then we showed um, that there were a number of, of languages that are decidable. That is, there exists a Turing machine which, um, well, let me just show this up in, in, uh, in specifics. Um, for example, one of the ones that we looked at was EQDFA, and that was to, you were given two DFAs, uh, A and B, uh, such that they, so you have two DFAs, description of two finite state machines, and you want to know whether or not those languages are equal. So that's the equivalence or equal, uh, equivalence or e equality question. And we said that's decidable. So what does that mean? It means there exists, there is a Turing machine, uh, M, that can, it can take in those other two um, descriptions of DFAs, and a description of a DFA is just a string, and decide, which means uh, determine whether this is, it should accept this A and B, or I guess I should have put this in some kind of uh, parentheses, and decide if um, if LA equals LB or not. So it, it accepts if they're equal and it rejects if they're not equal. So this is, the, this is just a reminder of what decidable means, that there is a Turing machine that can do this. And we looked at this last time, and, um, and this, in particular, this particular example um, relied on a little bit of, of um, uh, set theoretic kinds of considerations, but um, at heart is, is the issue of, of what can a Turing machine, uh, that, that the Turing machine can take in these two strings and do something non-trivial, that is decide whether the languages were, are equal or not. Okay, so today, uh, actually maybe I'll just um, remind you of one other problem um, that we also looked at. And that was um, where is it? A DFA 
and that is you take in a description of a, of a uh, DFA and an input W, and B is a DFA that accepts W. Okay? So here again, we, we showed that there was a Turing machine that could take in this input as a string, and then it could accept, it would accept this input if and only if the, the DFA B accepted W. And basically, the Turing machine that does this is a simulator. It, it takes in a description of B as a string, and then using that description, it, it can simulate what B does on input W. Okay? So a simulation, that was an important idea. So all of this is just a, re a reminder to get you up to speed of what we're going to do now. So now we want to look at an analogous question, which is for Turing machines. So we take in a description of a Turing machine and an input W. So M is a Turing machine that accepts W. So by the way, these brackets here, these, these um, whatever these symbols are, this is, just means that this is a description of. So we take in a description of M and W, and the description of M, of course, M is just given as, um, you know, the, the formal description of any Turing machine is something we've talked about in great detail. So you have the transition functions, and you have... Uh, the start state and the accept states and so on. Um, so in comes a description of, of a particular Turing machine M and in comes a particular input W and if M accepts W then um, uh, it's, this is in this language ATM. Okay? Question Is ATM decidable? Okay. So is there a Turing machine? Can we construct a Turing machine which takes in a description of some arbitrary other Turing machine? We don't, M, this M isn't fixed here. This is a, this is a whole language. This is a, uh, an infinite set. Um, so this is any Turing machine, M. Is there a Turing machine that can take in a description of any other Turing machine and an input and then um, determine whether or not M, that's the, that's the Turing machine that was given as input, accepts W? Okay? And is everybody clear on what the question is? It's just, it's just analogous to this question, but now in terms of Turing machines. And um, another question, is ATM recognizable? Okay. So decidable means that the Turing machine, there has to be a Turing machine that can take in M and W and either accept or reject. Recognizable is an easier condition to satisfy it says there has to be a Turing machine which will accept if uh, M and W, if M does accept W, okay? But if M doesn't accept W, then the Turing machine here could reject, that would be fine, or it could just go forever, all right? Those two are, possi those two are possible, whereas in the decider, it always has to either accept or reject on any input. It can't, uh, it can't just spin its wheels forever. So let's look at this question first, by the way. Um, is this language recognizable? Who said no? And why? Uh, 
Okay, you're, 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 you used both the words recognize and decide, but here I'm just talking about recognized. So, yeah, is, is this language recognizable? Okay, now it's, now it's yes, okay. <laughs> okay, so who says, who else wants to offer, uh, who says yes? Okay, and who says no? Okay, and who didn't answer? And who didn't answer when I asked who didn't answer? And who didn't answer when I asked who didn't answer who didn't answer? Any rate. Uh, okay, yes. In fact, this is, this, the answer here is yes. And what's the basic idea is that we can, ha we can build a Turing machine which can take in a description of another Turing machine and an input W and then start simulating what that Turing machine M does on W. Okay? And I actually want to talk a little bit about this because last time we were talking, in, here we were saying there is a Turing machine that can take in a description of, of a DFA and simulate it. And uh, I wanted to give more details then, but we didn't. So here I will do this a little bit. But let me give you again the, what the high idea is. There is a Turing machine which can take in the description of another Turing machine and um, and an input W. And the Turing machine we're going to build basically simulates what M does on input W. Now, if M ends up accepting W, then the simulator of M on input W will terminate and will recognize that this is, that M has accepted W. In which case, the, that simulating Turing machine will accept this input, which is the M comma W. So um, that makes the Turing machine we're going to build a recognizer for this language. It's not a decider for this language because if M on input W doesn't accept or reject, if it if it's, goes forever, then so will the simulator of M on input W. Okay. The simulator will not end up rejecting unless um, M, M rejects W. But if M goes forever on W, then so will the simulator. Okay? So build a Turing machine. I'll call it UTM. Take in the input M, W and simulate what M does on input W. Okay? So that if M accepts W, UTM will accept MW. So that makes it a recognizer. So UTM recognizes ATM. Okay. This particular Turing machine, which I haven't described, recognizes this language. But UTM is not a decider because if M on input W doesn't halt, doesn't terminate, then UTM has, has no way of terminating either because it's all it is doing is simulating what M does on W. Okay? UTM stands for a universal turning machine. Okay? It's a single, a single turning machine. It, 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 uh, is a single Turing machine, but it can take in the description of any other Turing machine and input for that Turing machine M and simulate what M does on input W. Okay? Now, we claim that UTM exists. And the book doesn't give you any justification for that. It just sort of says in passing UTM exists and 
you know, leaves it up to your intuition as a, now your vast experience as a, a Turing machine programmers to say, well, of course. Well, it's not so of course. In fact, last lecture where I was trying to do it off the top of my head, I, I didn't succeed. Um, but it is, it, it is true that UTM exists. There are your universal Turing machines. So today I want to do a little bit more detail to um, make it clear that, that the UTM does exist. How does this universal Turing machine uh, work? What, what are its innards? Okay. And again, it has no magic. It just has transition rules. It's, it's, this UTM has got to be described just in terms of the, the standard um, rules that are available to any old Turing machine. That is, it, it looks, it has states, it has finite states, and based on what state it's in, based on what symbol it's reading on the tape, it has a transition function which says what state it moves to and what symbol it writes on the tape. Okay, and it has accept states, it has reject states. Um, but it, it, it itself has got to look like a standard Turing machine, no magic at all. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, I'm just making this up at this point, but um, you, you can find uh, in other textbooks very clear, complete um, uh, descriptions of, of a UTM, but here's, which are probably more efficient and uh, more elegant than what I'm going to do. Um, but I hope this I hope this works. Okay, so my UTM is going to take in a description of M and W. So this is its input tape, and I think it's going to be very convenient to have multiple tapes just just to, tur to describe this. But we already know that multi multiple tape Turing machines can all can always be simulated by single tape Turing machines. So that's already a tool that's available to us. So I'm permitted to use any number of tapes that I want. So I'm going to have a tape here that's going to record uh, state, record one state. So this is basically Remember, the UTM is going to try to simulate what M does on input W, and I just want to be able to remember what state um, uh, M and W, sorry, M is in, okay, during the simulation. Okay, so M is, uh, is being given input W, and so M, if it was running, if M was running, it would be going through a series of states, and in the simulation, I just want to record what those states are. And we can just do that on a separate tape. That's, that's easiest. Um, and, and we'll see if I want more tapes than this. But right now, let's, let's just have that tape. Now, what about the alphabet for UTM? So um, I will assume that all um, Turing machines use some fixed alphabet. OK. They have sigma, gamma. Um, and why, can I, why is that OK to assume that? So we, in what we've been dealing with so far, we had Turing machines at a different alphabet. Sometimes it was binary, sometimes it was um, some number of letters, uh, and so on. But everything, ultimately, all, all alphabets can be rewritten in binary anyway. Okay. So however rich the actual alphabet is, it can be rewritten um, as a binary in, in terms of a binary alphabet. So we can assume here that uh, all the Turing machines actually use some fixed and known alphabet or al alphabets. And gamma is the, um, uh, the tape alphabet. And um, for convenience, it was, it was different than, the, than sigma. But again, everything can be done in binary. Uh, or if I want to just, for a little convenience, um, I can make these both ASCII or something like that. Okay? So 
in, in this simulation, this is very important, um, that we know ahead of time what the alphabet is going to be. So the universal Turing machine, what is it going to do? What's its alphabet? Of course, it has to have, um, it has to be able to, to recognize all the, lang all the characters that are uh, in, um, in W. A W comes from, from sigma, right, or sigma star. Um, but the description of M might be a little richer, so um, I'll, I'll just let it um, plus whatever it needs. to describe uh, any M. So this is a description of the Turing machine M. Okay? And what is, again, what is the description of a Turing machine M? You have to specify what the start state is. Well, we've always called that you know, Q with some subscript. Okay? So that, that's just a number. So it's a binary number. Okay, so that's not a problem. Um, then we have uh, transition rules, okay? The transition rules, what do they look like? It's some state and then some input or something that's written on the tape, okay? Well, the state, okay, this is not bounded um, a priori. We don't know how many states the Turing machines have. In fact, if we have an infinite number of Turing machines, we're going to need larger and larger numbers of states, okay? But again, a state, how did we describe states? It was Q with some subscript. So again, the states can be described just as a binary number, okay? That's all, it's just a name. In any particular Turing machine, if you show me a particular Turing machine, I can rename those states as long as I appropriately re, uh, recode the transition rules, okay? So this is also just, these states are just um, numbers or, or it can be written in binary. So that's not a problem. Um, gamma here, well, of course, then we need, this has to have gamma. Okay. It's got to be able to um, deal with anything that this, that M would write on its tape. The Turing machine, the universal Turing machine has got to be able to deal with. But these these are fixed ahead of time. So when I build this universal Turing machine, I can certainly build in that particular alphabet. I'm just trying to get away from the problem where y you think, okay, the, the infinite set of alphabets are going to be over, infinite set of Turing machines are going to be over different alphabets, and how could the one Turing machine that I build now possibly know what all those other alphabets are going to be? And I'm saying, but because we can fix sigma and, and gamma ahead of time, we can build those into the universal Turing machine. Now, the universal Turing machine from convenience might want some additional symbols like a delimiter between the different transition rules in this description. Okay. So you can give it a few extra symbols. Um, so when the input here, its, its tape input or its input uh, alphabet can be just a little bit richer, but you should convince yourself that it's only richer by a few, a finite number of symbols. Okay, we want a delimiter between the transition rules and a delimiter between the um, uh, the descriptions, uh, the states that are in the uh, describe the final states, the accept states and the reject states, and so on. But just a few little punctuation marks. Okay, so the universal Turing machine, it has a built-in alphabet, which is rich enough to be able to read any description of a Turing machine. All right, so what, in this M, what's actually in there? It's transition rules, among other things. So all the transition rules are written there. Okay, so we have state um, Q7. If you see a zero as input, then you go to um, Q19 and you write uh, a 1, okay? And you move left. And then some kind of delimiter and then another transition rule and so on. So this is, this is the kind of thing that's written on the tape when we're describing M. It's, it's all the transition rules for M. But, but basically, 
notice that this is just going to be a number. It's going to be 7 written, let's say, in binary. And this is going to be 19 in binary. And then we have this punctuation mark. And then we have um, something over the, uh, the um, tape alphabet. And then we have a left or right. So everything is, all I'm trying to do is convince you that there is this universal Turing machine which I can build, which certainly can take in a description of another Turing machine and know what, and, and be able to recognize that uh, encoding for what it means. And then we have some kind of delimiter, and then we have W. Okay? Now I'm giving the, the camera person fits because we're spanning two, two boards, and I can see you haven't quite done it. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So this is what's on the input tape for the universal Turing machine. All right. Now the universal Turing machine has to simulate what M does on W. So what does that mean? It has to uh, go through a succession of states. It has to look at different uh, characters on the tape. It has to decide what to write uh, and um, uh, what to, whether to move left or right. Okay. So let's see if we can invent the rules in here at a kind of high level, at a level where you are already convinced that you could, you could implement those kinds of uh, rules or those kinds of actions in real Turing machine transition function, all the way down to the bits and bytes and you know, the gory details of what the transition function for the universal Turing machine is. Okay, So here's what I want it to do. I want it to record what state M is in, record one state uh, that M is in down here, okay, and then, um, well, actually, let's put another tape here. We're going to have characters, and so this is going to record what character uh, M is reading. OK, so how do we start out the simulation? What's, what's going to be written down here? Well, OK, we start out the simulation. I'm going to have transition rules in here, which is going to scan this input tape until it sees what the, um, the start state is called. Somewhere in here is a description of what the start state is, which is just some binary number, right? It's Q sub something. We've always used Q0 or Q1. But this description of the Turing machine, somewhere in there says, this is what the start state is called. It's Q sub something or other. Probably either 0 or 1. And certainly, can you write a, a Turing machine rules, transition rules, which just scans here, looking for the delimiter, looking for the punctuation mark, that says this next number is going to be what the, um, uh, what the subscript on the start state is. That's simple. That's a simple Turing machine kind of thing that you, could, you certainly should be able to construct. So that's the first thing that's going to happen in here. It's just going to scan across here till it sees what number is the, um, is the uh, start, describes the start state, and it's going to record that number here. Okay, so I said it was, let, let's say for some bizarre reason, this is a Turing machine where the start state is um, 5. Okay, so in binary it's going to write 101. One. Now, how does it actually do that, by the way? Let's, let's go even lower level. It zips across here till it finds the, the um, symbol that says the next numbers in here describe what the start state is. Okay, but it can't read this all at once. Why? Because this is a number that could be bigger than the number of states that this universal Turing machine has. The universal Turing machine is a single machine. It has some fixed number of states. So the Turing machine can't remember what this number is here by going into some particular state because there are too few of them. So how does this, 
how do we even get this number written over here? Who can tell me? If this was on an exam, you could. Most of you, anyway. What's the answer? <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> okay. I'm all, anyway, never mind. <laughs> You're a good student. You should pay attention. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So, well, it, it's just very low-level Turing machine grungy kind of things. The Turing machine is going to have, this universal Turing machine is going to have rules that says, run over till you see the delimiter, the punctuation mark that says, this is where the subscript that identifies the start state is. And there's the first bit, okay? Now, this, alpha, this alphabet is finite, and it's, it's known when I built this universal Turing machine. I'm, I'm just assuming it's binary. So definitely, this Turing machine can go into a state which remembers, which is effectively remembering what this first bit was. Now, it, um, based on seeing that bit, it writes that bit here. Okay? And then it moves over by one, and based on seeing what that bit is, goes into the appropriate state, where in that state it writes uh, the next bit there. So, and so on. So you can do that. You can, you can write down what that state is here. So now we know what the state is. Next thing that, that this Turing machine is going to do is run over till it sees the delimiter that says, where's the input? Okay? And here's, so it finds a delimiter that, that um, is from some fixed alphabet. And uh, the delimiter says, okay, the delimiter means that, that the um, input to M is written there. Where does the universal Turing machine want to go on that input? This is just the very beginning of the, the simulation. This universal Turing machine is simulating Turing machine M given input W. What's the first thing that M does on input W? It reads the first character. Right? It always starts at the left end of, of W. So the universal Turing machine is going to go over here to the first character just, pia just past that uh, punctuation mark that says this is where the input is. And it reads that first character. Now, um, I'm going to record it over here, which I, we may not need, but I'm just trying to make life easy. Let's say it's W1. And so we're going to record W1 here. Uh, again, I'm not sure we need this, but um, OK. And um, so it, it, it reads um, W1. OK, so now it knows. Uh, it's, it's recorded what state M is in. It's recorded what character W1 is, is uh, that M is looking at. And now what does it have to do? It has to change. So inside here is some transition rule. Inside here there's a transition rule. There's a delta which goes 101, that's the state. W1, that's the character that we're, being, that we're looking at on the tape, and it goes to some other state, okay, QI, and something you're going to write, uh, and I'll call it X, and either a left or a right, okay? So this universal Turing machine needs to know what M would do. What would M do when M is in this state and is reading this character. So how does the universal Turing machine do that? So now the universal Turing machine has got to scan. The, the answer is that the universal Turing machine has got to scan the transition rules that are written here to find the appropriate transition rule. 
What does it mean, the appropriate transition rule? It's got to find a transition rule which is specified that way. It's specified this is the particular state we're in that M is in, and this is the particular character that M is reading. All right? So how does the universal Turing machine do that? I want to, before I do that, I want to re remember where the read head is in here. So what I'm going to do is um, rewrite this as something with a mark over it. Remember, we've used these marks. So this universal Turing machine is going to have an alphabet. Its tape alphabet is going to be something which might be double. Um, it's going to have the, the, the um, so it's going to have gamma, uh, I boxed myself in here. It's going to have de, um, sigma, it's going to have gamma, which is, the, which is the tape alphabet for M, and it's going to have um, gamma with, with dots. So again, gamma is finite, and so gamma with dots is finite also. It's just a doubling of it. So we can build that into this universal Turing machine. And the point of that is just to be able to put a mark here to say, where was the read head? Because we're going to have to move this read head. And I could have invented another tape to do that and not have to worry about this, but I didn't. So we'll go with what I'm doing. So we're going to later be able to come back here because this is marked. All right. So now. This universal Turing machine is trying to find the transition rule in here that has got this particular state, the state that's written there, and has this particular character, the character is written there. Okay? How does this universal Turing machine find that? Well, it moves the, t the read head on this tape all the way back to the beginning to where the uh, transition rules are written. And that's why I wanted to put a mark here for where, we were, where M was, where M's reading head is uh, on this input, because we, we have to do something that M is not doing. So the universal Turing machine brings its, this head all the way over here, it recognizes that, well, it's at the end here, and so we have delimiters between transition rules, so it recognizes when it's in a, in a, a transition rule. The, the components of a transition rule are some number here, which is a state number, and then a character. So the first thing it's doing is it's looking through here to find a state number, which is equal to that. Now, how does, it, how does a Turing machine determine that two numbers are equal? Remember, this, the numbers that are going to be used here are the number of states in M. And the number of states in M can be bigger than the number of states in the universal Turing machine. So the universal Turing machine can't remember, just, it can't use its particular states to remember what uh, number it's looking for. But it's got the number here. So it can scan until it sees a state number. And then it can do a comparison one character at a time. Now, this is 7, and this is 5. So this is 1, 1, 1. So it compares the first character. They're equal. Inside here, it has you know, the logic which says, if these two are equal, then we're going to move over, move the read head here one, and move the read head here, head here one. Okay. If these are equal, then it would move it again. But they're not equal. And so it knows then that this is not the appropriate transition rule that it's looking for. All right? So then it's, it's got logic which says, keep moving until you hit the next transition rule. All right? And check whether it, first the state number is, is the correct one. It isn't. Keep moving and so on until you find a, um, a transition rule which has the right state number. So hopefully everybody can see that that's pretty simple to do in a universal Turing machine. So now you find, you find a, um, 
a transition rule that has the right state number. It's equal to that. The next thing you do is you look at the uh, character that's written. There's a punctuation mark, and so the next thing is a character, and you check whether it's equal to that. All right. If it's not equal to that, then you keep moving till you find another transition rule with the right state number, and you check the character that's there. All right. Ultimately, you find one, or um, well, actually, in the description of Turing machines, you you, sh you will find one. Um, sometimes we've omitted uh, particular combinations in, um, uh, in in our writing down of specific Turing machines, uh, and then we have to decide in that case if it's if the rule isn't there, does that mean the Turing machine rejects at that moment or spins its wheels forever? But in the full definition of a Turing machine, every state cross input is there uh, in the transition rules. So ultimately, you will find a transition rule which has this state number and this particular input. Okay? And, and you're doing it with just these simple, standard Turing machine kinds of things. Check this bit against that bit. Check this bit against that bit. And you can check for equality of a finite alphabet. You can certainly build that into the, into the logic of this once and forever Turing machine. So it finds, the right, it finds the right transition rule, and that transition rule you know, says what you do. Here we are over here. The transition rule that's written over on the tape says you move to this state, you write this symbol, and you move left or right. OK, so on the basis of that, we move to this state, which means we write that down over here. Let's say it's now state. Um, 11. What's 11 in binary? I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, it's what? 1011. 1011. Okay, let's say that's 11 in binary. So again, it, how does it do that in, in gross detail? So this, <laughs> anyway. 101. In gross detail, it copies the first bit and then copies the second bit and copies and so on. So certainly can write down here what the new state is that M should be in. And then, what's uh, the new character? Well, it can write that down here, but it should also write it on, the, on this tape. Okay? So it zips back over here to, um, to find the character that was marked. Okay? This is a finite alphabet, so it can do it. And it writes the new, the new character. All right. Um, and then, oh, then it's got to go back to the transition rule. How does it do that? Well, there are two possible answers at this point that somebody should come up with. So it was in the middle of looking at a transition rule. It was written on the tape here, the appropriate transition rule. And it just it now went over here and changed what's on the tape. But now it's got to um, decide whether it's going to go left or right. Can you just mark the transition? Yeah, you could have marked it, the transition you were looking at. Or, again, you know, the tails of Turing machines can be very gross. You could have the Turing machine go back to the beginning and start looking for the appropriate uh, transition. Let's mark it, okay? So we'll have marked the uh, right transition rule. So it now goes back to it and looks to see whether there was a left or a right. It goes into a state based on the left and right. That's the way it remembers that. Goes back over to here and then moves this head appropriately left or right. Well, of course, on the, on the first time, it's going to be, well, uh, moved right. Um, and it also, of course, when it goes into a state, a particular state, it wants to check whether that's an accept state. All right. So it should also scan here till it, it, it finds the places where this, the accept states are written as numbers, as binary numbers, and checks bit by bit, is this equal to one of the accept states? 
And if it is, then it accepts. Okay? All right, so this is kind of really gross, grungy, Turing machine programming, and not even all the way down. I mean, I haven't written out transition functions for you, but I hope now seeing this, you feel convinced that, yes, there is such a thing as this universal Turing machine. It's a once and for all machine. I mean, people actually have written out the full transition functions of universal Turing machines, and you could even implement that as a program today um, on a computer. So um, universal Turing machines exist that can take in the description of any other Turing machine and, and its input and, um, and simulate what M would do on that input. OK, I, I guess I should also say, um, yeah, if, if we see that we're in a state that's an accept state, obviously this accepts. If we see that, if it sees, if the universal Turing machine sees that uh, it arrived at a state that's a reject state, then it rejects. And so the universal Turing machine does actually simulate exactly in terms of the, the uh, final result, accept or reject. And also what's written on the tape here. What's written on the tape at this point is exactly what M would have written on its tape on input W. OK? All right. Um, any questions on this? How many people are excited by this level of detail? <laughs> How many people are grossed out? Yeah, uh, I am. Right, but it's important, I think, to be con completely convinced. I mean, I, even I, when I read that in, in um, Sipser's book, says, oh, yeah, we'll just have this universal Turing machine. I, you know, I had to stop and say, well, how do we really know that this thing exists? We have to, you have to see some of the grunge to be convinced of it. So this was the five minutes I was going to give you at the beginning of this lecture on the grunge, and <laughs> it takes longer. All right. But there's another philosophical point that I want to make here, that we said an algorithm is an idea or a method or procedure that you can implement as some specific Turing machine. That means that for every algorithm, you have some specific, actual, separate, different Turing machine. Different algorithm, different Turing machine. Okay, Is that what current computers are like? Do we have a different computer for every different algorithm we want to run? No. What have we got? We've got one box. And what does it do? It's programmable. What does a programmable mean? It means it reads in a program, or it's already got it stored, but basically somebody has written a description of that algorithm in some symbolic way, and then that computer can execute that description of that algorithm and do the appropriate computations. So what's a universal Turing machine? A universal Turing machine is like a computer. So at each individual Turing machine is like an algorithm. The universal Turing machine is like a computer, like a programmable computer. It can f be fed in a description of another Turing machine, which means it's, it's fed in a description of an algorithm. Okay, So whereas an algorithm is sort of equivalent to a Turing machine, each algorithm is equivalent to some Turing machine. A computer, a programmable computer, is like a universal Turing machine. So Turing not only formalized what it means to be an algorithm, he formalized what it meant to be a com programmable computer. A programmable computer is a universal Turing machine. And in fact, um, at least this is the story that's always told, um, this, this particular viewpoint of um, what, a, what a general purpose computing machine would be, it would be essentially a universal Turing machine, which he um, did in the 1940s, or maybe even a little bit earlier, I don't know exactly the dates, that is actually influential in how real computers were ultimately designed and, and built. It was, it was part of the decisions on how to, on the architecture, which today seems so natural. Of course, we have, we have this general purpose 
uh, you've got the CPU and you know, the general purpose computing part of a computer, and then we have this stored program. And the, the CPU reads the program, and based on the program, it, it does the appropriate actions. Well, that's exactly what the universal Turing machine is. And the story is that actually Turing's theoretical views, which predated real computers, was very influential in how, in how people decided on the architecture of, of real computers later on. Okay, so now that we know um, that universal Turing machines can be built, let's go back to this question. Is the ATM decidable? Is there a Turing machine um, which can take in the description of another Turing machine and another W, and uh, input W, and simulate what M does on input um, on that input W if M accepts W and, and so on. Is this doable? So okay, so um, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, we're talking still about recognition. And the answer here is yes, because this universal Turing machine can take in M and W, and we just did in gross detail, the universal Turing machine simulates M on W. If M accepts W, then the universal Turing machine will accept. If M rejects W, the universal Turing machine will reject. But if M does not halt on W, the universal Turing machine will also not halt on W. It's just a one-to-one -one, um, simulation. So that proves that uh, that the language ATM is recognizable. Yes. Okay. Now, is ATM decidable? Okay. The simulator, the universal Turing machine that we just built, does not always halt. If, if M does not halt when it's being given W, the universal Turing machine will also not halt when it's being fed in M and W. So we certainly haven't proven yet that ATM is decidable. All that we did over there was to show that ATM is recognizable. It doesn't establish that ATM is decidable. So is ATM decidable? Any ideas? No? Why not? Hmm? Because not all the Turing machines are what? It's true that not all Turing machines are deciders. I'm not sure how that establishes that this particular language is not decidable. Yeah. If you give it uh, an M that, or if you give it an M with a W where M would go forever, then how would you terminate that? Okay, and you probably didn't hear it in the back. It's if you give, if you give what? If you give ATM the input of M with W, where W would cause M to not terminate. Yeah. Would... So you're saying if there was some Turing machine that could decide ATM, and if AT, and if that Turing machine, if that particular Turing machine was given a description MW, where M doesn't halt when given W, how could the Turing machine that you're proposing ever exist? Well, that's intuition. That's, that's um, you know, absence of evidence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, okay, or whatever. One of those little things. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you don't know how to do it. And it sort of, uh, therefore, it feels obvious that it can't be done. But that's not a mathematical proof. Okay, it, it may be um, it may be quite realistic and, and appropriate. You might get to the right answer that way, but um, it's not a mathematical proof that there is no Turing machine that can decide this language ATM. Any other ideas? Okay, so we want to yeah. I could figure out 
then it would or would not terminate on a particular input. Like if it's a human, we're trying to do it. Uh -huh. And then they can tell if it's accepted or rejected the input, obviously. But like, sooner or later, I feel like we can figure out that if it's not going to terminate. Okay, so yeah, you're saying yes, this is decidable because you feel that if you were watching some Turing machine M on input W and it was going for a long time, you could ultimately decide that oh, it's just going to go forever, so I should reject. I'd like to know how you do that, but uh, okay, that's your answer, yeah. Yeah, that's actually an interesting idea. So you're saying that um, W is always of some, some uh, finite. It's a finite object. It can, there's, it's unbounded in terms of how big it is, but for any particular W, it's of some um, finite size. And therefore, um, and, and what's, what is the uh, tape? Uh, the, the, what's, going, what's, what's being written on the Turing machine tape is just based on a finite set of symbols, finite alphabet. Um, so you're saying if, if, if the computation goes long enough that um, it has, the tape has got to return to the same configuration at some point. And again, the set of states are finite too, so the state has got to be, um, uh, and so this is, how you, this is how you loop forever as you go back to some same configuration and you should be able to detect that somehow. Well, hold that thought. Yeah, what, what you were you going to say? Okay. Okay, well, we'll have to return to that because that sounds good. Um, but I'm going to prove that there is no Turing machine that, that can decide this, so there's got to be something wrong. Um, we'll try to figure out later what that is. Okay, so is ATM decidable? Um, I'm going to show you that the answer is no. I don't think I'll get to be able, I don't think I'll finish it today, but I want to we need to sort of um, uh, build up some tools. Um, well, that's the way the book does it. It builds up some tools at this point before it shows you the proof. But I think I could actually go directly to the proof, and that might make more sense in terms of the time we have. And then later we'll go back to the um, tools because those are very, very useful more generally. Um, let me just look at this quickly, make sure I'm not going to box myself in because I'm jumping over some material. Uh, I think I can do this without the intermediate material. Okay. Okay, so the proof is going to be by contradiction. We're going to assume that there does exist some Turing machine which can decide this language. Okay, so suppose there is a Turing machine, we'll call it H, that can decide ATM. So just, again, reminding you what H should look like. H takes in a description of a Turing machine and some input. And it will accept if M accepts W. And it will reject if M does not accept W. Okay? So M does not accept W. That, that means either M rejects W or M goes forever on input W. So, because um, the question over here, the language is that um, M is a Turing machine that accepts W. So we want to say yes or no, accept or reject this input. 
So accept if M accepts W and reject if M doesn't accept W. Yeah? Is W a finite Yes. Right. W is some particular input, so it's always of some, uh, no strings that we're dealing with are infinite, but yet there's no bound on how big W can be. We're not saying that the only inputs to M will be of some uh, bounded length. They can, there's no bound on that, but any, any particular W has a fixed real length. Okay, so this is what I want from H. So, um, so what I'm going to so suppose this exists. There is a Turing machine that actually can do this. Now I'm going to build a different Turing machine, which does the following thing. Now construct a different Turing machine. D for different, um, and what's the input to D? D takes an input, which is just a description of a Turing machine. We don't see what uh, any particular input that's given to M. It just takes in the input of a Turing machine. Well, that's not a problem. We've talked in detail about how uh, one Turing machine can take in the description of another Turing machine. Okay? Then what does D do? D simulates H. How does D simulate H? Well, H is a Turing machine. H is an actual Turing machine. So all this means is that D has within it this Turing machine H. Okay? And it's going to have other things, but it certainly can have Turing machine H inside it. Now, the book calls this a subroutine, which I don't like. I don't like this idea because it's, it makes you, that, that word, because it makes you think of real subroutines the way we know them, that somehow a Turing machine can call something, a subroutine, and then get an answer back. And Turing machines certainly can't do that. A Turing machine just has those transition rules. But a Turing machine can have built into it some other Turing machine, and therefore, it can it can put uh, it, it can uh, start executing these transition rules, and then based on what uh, this Turing machine does, the larger Turing machine can do something based on that output. So when you read in the book and it says, "Oh, we're going to use H as a subroutine," that's what it means. It puts H inside D, which is no problem, and and so D simulates H. But on what input? On input M, comma, remember, H has a particular Turing machine and has a particular input. Well, what's the input? It's that. Okay, we really have to parse this. Okay? So what does is, what is, um, H typically get? It gets a... Turing machine, a description of a Turing machine, and um, and some particular input to that Turing machine. The input to the Turing machine is just a string. Now, for particular Turing machines, those strings to be relevant to its computation are usually over some restricted set of strings. But uh, in, a, in a definition of a Turing machine, there's no restriction on what the inputs can be as long as they're in the right alphabet, and we, we've already fixed the alphabet. So as foolish as it may seem, it's certainly legitimate to give to the Turing machine M an input which is just a description of M. Remember, description of M is just its transition rules and so on written out. So this is just a string. So this is a, a description of M being given a description of M. Okay? Everybody follow that? So this is a description of M being given a description of M. 
That's what D does. And what is it? What does it accept and reject? D accepts M if H rejects M M. Okay? And D rejects M if H accepts M M. So basically all D is doing, D is just being given the description of a Turing machine. It then simulates what H would do if H was given a description of that same Turing machine with a description of that Turing machine. Okay? Well, H on this input, H is a decider. We've, we've already said H is deciding ATM. So it's a decider. It always accepts or rejects. It never goes forever. So H will ultimately accept or reject. And then D just reverses the decision. Okay? D is the Supreme Court, and it, re it just reverses the decision of the appellate court, or whatever. D will accept its input if H rejects what it's being, what it runs on. And D rejects, similarly D rejects its input if H accepts that. So, so far you should be able to see that all of this is buildable. This is all, if H exists, if H really does exist, then D exists. Okay, because all D is doing is something here which is very standard um, uh, Turing machine kinds of operations and H is going to uh, do the main work and then D, uh, when H ends up in an accept state, D will move into a reject state. If H accept ends up in an, a reject state, D moves into an accept state. And so that's, we can build all this. So if H exists, D exists. Let me maybe go over here. Clearly, if H exists, then D exists. Okay, that's what I've established so far. Now, consider. Um, D on input D. Okay? We just said if H exists, D exists. What does D do? D takes in a description of a Turing machine. It can take in a description of any arbitrary Turing machine. So there's no reason why D can't take in a description of itself. Okay? So consider what happens uh, when D takes input D. Well, unfortunately, it's on the other side, so they go over here. So we'll, this, is the general, this is the general statement of what D does when it's being given input M. Okay? But now it's being given input D. But this is what D does any time it's given an input M. So if we're specializing to D, we just replace M with D everywhere, right? We place M everywhere with, with D. Chalk. You don't, uh, the camera doesn't have to move. Uh, uh, not chalk, eraser. So I'm just going to replace M with D, because that's what we're considering now. What happens when D is given a description of itself? OK? So D accepts that particular input if H rejects D, D, okay? And D rejects D if H accepts D, D. Okay? So far, all right. 
But when does H, let's put it this, this way, when does H accept DD? When D accepts D? Yeah. Um, so, here, but H accepts DD exactly when D accepts D, right? Just again, talking about what H does, and we, we see that in general over here, okay? H accepts, so we'll just change this here. H accepts DD if D accepts D. And reje H rejects if D doesn't accept D. So you put these two things together. D rejects D if H accepts this. But H accepts if D accepts D. So we have D rejects D if D accepts D. All right? Again, we've, we've said if H exists, then D exists. Okay? We had a general schema here for what it means for H to accept a particular Turing machine on a particular input. We wrote it down here, but now we've substituted the particular Turing machine as D, and the particular input is the description of D. Okay? And then we had what it meant for D to accept a particular Turing machine on a particular input. Okay? And, but now we're replacing with the particular Turing machine as D, and the particular input is the description of D. And now you just link all these things together. D rejects D if H accepts this, DD. H accepts DD exactly when D accepts D. So D rejects D exactly when D accepts D. Contradiction. That can't be, there is no such Turing machine that does that, that accepts if and only if it rejects. And we, could, we should uh, follow the same logic here. D accepts D if H rejects D on the description of D. Okay. If H rejects H rejects if D doesn't accept D. So we have D accepts if D doesn't accept. Again, this contradiction, it can't be. All right? Um, all right, back over to here. So we've proven that D accepts D if and only if D rejects D. Contradiction. So we start out in this proof with a supposition. We suppose that H exists. And we've run through these steps, these logical steps, where in the end we get this clear contradiction. So we have to conclude that H doesn't exist. Okay? And this is the famous theorem that the halting problem is undecidable. That's what, that's what this is called. The ATM is decidable. This, is, this problem is ATM decidable. This is also called the halting problem. Because the crux of the difference between 
whether ATM is recognizable or ATM is decidable is whether or not there's a Turing machine that can decide whether um, a specific Turing machine on a specific input will actually halt. Because we know that we can build a Turing machine that will accept if M accepts its input. But that Turing machine gets into trouble if the Turing machine is given M actually runs forever on W. But if we had another Turing machine that could decide whether or not M was going to halt on W, then we would just incorporate that as well. And if it decided that M was not going to halt on W, then it would allow this Turing machine to reject. And then um, the language ATM would be decidable. But now we've just shown that that doesn't exist. Therefore, there's no Turing machine that can take in an arbitrary Turing machine and a W and decide whether that Turing machine can halt, will halt. Okay. Will halt, not can. Okay, uh, I, I see glazed eyes. This is, this is um, hard. It's a mind twister. It's, there is a book, I should have brought it in. Many of you may have seen it or heard of. It was very uh, popular about 20 or 30 years ago called Girdle, Escher, and Bach. Okay? doesn't mention Turing in the, in the title, which is too bad, because most of it is about, well, a lot of it is about Turing. But it, it's all about these kinds of little um, uh, puzzles, what seems like puzzles or, or paradoxes or contradictions of this self-reference type. So what we just showed is an argument that, that's sometimes called self-referential. Whatever, however you spell it. Um, is it a T or a C there? Referential. Well, whatever. Um, it's, it's, um, you know, because D is taking in a description of D. That's, that's self-referential in some ways. Or, at any rate, and a lot of um, the sort of profound, deep results of the 1930s, Gödel's theorem. How many people have heard of Gödel's theorem? Okay, a couple of people. Well, I'll mention it a little bit more. And the book actually has a, a brief proof of Gödel's theorem. Gödel's theorem basically says that there are theorems in um, about arithmetic, theorems that concern just simple arithmetic, that are true, but can't be proven. There is no proof. So Gödel's theorem says there are, there are things that are that are true statements that are true, but there is no proof. There cannot be a proof for them. And the logic involved in Gödel's theorem is all this self-referential stuff. And you just and the Gödel, Escher, and Bach book is, is just full of all this this kind of self-referentials and recursions that lead you into paradoxes. And it's very very mystical. He writes it in a way to make it seem very mystical. But really, this is a, I wrote this proof with a piece of chalk on a blackboard. I mean, it's really, it exists. It does take a little bit of mind gymnastics, uh, you know, to go through it and not get confused. But there it is. It's, it's, a, it's a proof that um, H cannot exist. Okay, and it's, an, it's a proof that uses self-reference. Now, next time, I'll give you a different proof um, on, based on what's called diagonalization. And I personally think that proofs by diagonalization are, are less mystical than proofs by self-reference. And it takes a lot of the mystery out of it. And I don't think the book Gödel, Escher, and Bach does much with diagonalization because then it would it would just make everything too clear and simple, and you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be a, a, a philosophical book and all that. All right, next time.